you don't know Van Benham and Van Benham and Cher, obviously. And is, am I correct, literary associate? Is that your correct title? Artistic associate. Artistic associate slash literary <laughs> at Malthouse Theatre. Uh, Dr. Chris Mead <laughs> is the outgoing. <laughs> I thought it would help me get upgraded. <laughs> Outgoing artistic director of Playwriting Australia and the incoming literary manager. Is that the correct title? I think I'm literary director. Literary director. <laughs> At the moment, you're the company. Hamish Michael, who of course you all know. <coughs> Stephen <laughs> Sewell. <laughs> you, you've spoken. Thank you. Know you. <laughs> Stephen Sewell, freelance playwright, rebel rouser. Troublemaker. Fun <laughs> 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 and good uh, And Kate Mulvaney, who's one of our most exciting young writers, wonderful, wonderful actress, and uh, a great all round artist. So, welcome all of you. So, I was thinking about this, they don't write them like they used to, idea, and I suppose just, I thought I'd, I'd just start by unpacking what, what I think, or, or what it suggests to me. I guess I, I'm, I'm really not sure what the question means. Um, particularly in the in the in, in the light of so much what I'm calling renovation at the moment, by which I mean things like Hagos Thaestes and you know all, all all over. I'm not sure um, how much of it's made it down here. I know some of Tom Holloway's work has, but there's uh, a great deal of work going on at the moment with people working with older texts and reinventing, rewriting, reshaping, and including the Nest, which is uh, even subtitled after the Philistines. Um, and I'm just wondering if it's maybe a case of plus a change, you know, that if you look at, it, it, is Hamlet any less a political play than, than Hayden or Blind Jones Dancing? I don't really know. But I thought I might start by asking you, Stephen, because you've been around the longest. <laughs> <laughs> as, our, as our senior panelist. It wasn't my fault. That's right. <laughs> if you look at the theatre now, um, it, it, it's kind of current 2012 world, and when you started writing in, I suppose, the late 70s? Is that Mid 70s. Mid 70s. Um, do you feel like it's radically different, or? The two major differences I would, I would say are that at that time, in the, in the mid 70s, and the, well, the, you know, the, the beginning, really, of the, of the second wave of, of, of Australian playwright and Australian uh, national theatre. Uh, we were, nobody had the vague idea of what we were doing. You know, we, we were throwing ourselves into, into uh, uh, the world of theatre simply because we thought it would be a good idea, but we didn't actually know what we were doing. So that, you know, in, in, if there's a difference, as, as, as this topic is suggesting, between the way we used to write and the way we write now, it would be that when we were writing, when I started writing, I had no idea what I was doing. The first time I ever went into a theatre was, a t was, a, you know, was a, the, the day that I walked in with, with a play. Um, and so the, the kinds of support, support and knowledge and wisdom that, uh, that are, are, are now brought to bear on new writers and young writers just wasn't available at that point. And it wasn't just writers, you know, it was everybody. The directors, the, the actors, like nobody knew what they were doing. <laughs> and the other side of it is, I think, you know, while that has been going on, the political situation has changed. You know, we, we entered theatre as, as really, uh, I think, as, as, polit as, as political, as rebels. You know, we, we wanted to build a national theatre to build an Australian nation, a nation. That's kind of where, we, you know, where we were coming from. Now that impulse, uh, I don't think is, is quite so strong. It is, it is strong in certain sectors. The Aboriginal, Aboriginal theatre, I think, is, is, very, is still very driven by, you know, by a, a, an anger and a fury and a determination. But other parts of, of, of our theatrical experience have simply become you know, doing theatre. So I, I think that would be two. You know, we were amateurs, but we were passionate. But I think like, um, people aren't quite amateurs anymore. They're, they're, they're very good. Very good practitioners, very good uh, actors, very good writers, very good, you know, very good everything. But perhaps the, the passion and the determination to see it in a political in, in, in a political uh, way has uh, uh, has been blunted. 
And do you see that as, as something about the, the industry, this is always a strange term because it's such a cottage industry, but the industry itself, or do you think that's a, a, a wider, um, I know we shouldn't use this word, but I will, a wider kind of zeitgeist idea? Um, I know, that's <laughs> fucking. Yeah, I, 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 think it's, I think it's what you said. Um, I mean, obviously, it's not the same all over the world, and I think that probably in, in, um, in Cairo at the moment, there are, there are some passionate people um, developing new theatrical and, and filmic ideas about, uh, about what, what it could be and what it should be. Um, and Australia's just not part of that, part of that uh, mix. I'm going to throw to you there, Van, because you're at the other end of the spectrum, a younger, younger playwright, but also, like Stephen, your work is intensely political. Mm. Well, um, I mean, it's, it's explicitly political. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm from that rather old school historical materialist Marxist school that says all work is material. So and, um, <laughs> and we all are. Is, is political. And um, I, I just find it, yeah, I, I mean, my issue is, I, I mean, I did my thesis on Stephen, which I find, mm. you know, now that we're grown up, so my theory is programming his work, like, hilarious. Um, so my knowledge of that period, uh, the, for Stephen is personal for me, is historical and academic and certainly it's interesting for me as a practitioner to look at a generation of playwrights who were nation building and were explicit in that project because where I get very frustrated with my generation of playwrights is, and those who are younger and um, obviously my work at the Malt House I have a lot to do with Gen Y playwrights and you know, I'm sort of forced to talk to the men. Uh, <laughs> that's a joke, that's me being funny. Apparently, I don't, <laughs> don't smile. I've got bad wisdom tooth problems, and apparently, I don't smile when I tell jokes, and people think I'm quite hostile. So, if you think I'm being hostile, just imagine how much better it would be if I was smiling. Um, yeah, and it, it's interesting when I get playwrights, like, oh, I don't really have an opinion, I don't really know about that, um, I'm not really engaged with those issues, which is something I, I just find bizarre to think that we've gone from a situation in Australia where you had playwrights who not only saw themselves as public intellectuals but activist intellectuals who forcibly in many you know seizing space and, and hammering away at a at a cultural national discourse that you know and, and this is uh, this is not just an Australian phenomenon because I've worked as a literary manager in the UK for many years and spent a lot of time in America and have been on the festival circuit there. Like a a broader cultural phenomenon of playwrights who don't actually want to speak to their culture, where it's, it, you know, it's vocational, but in the sense that it's about self-expression of the personal, as opposed to the public and the political. And I, I find this really confounding, um, because as far as I'm concerned, you know, like the reason why you create a cultural artifact is because you are trying, you're, it's like building a brick with which to remodel a wall. Like you create a piece of culture because there is something in your culture that needs to be remade or built or redressed. And I do find that really frustrating in terms of um, a lack of explicit political discourse. And I think we can understand that in terms of like a, a post-Cold War epoch where certain words were so demonised by, you know, the, those generations of, you know, discursive war, you know, words like socialism mm. and capitalism mm. that are just words that describe what things are. But you say the word capitalism and everybody it, it has the connotations of some kind of uncool university Marxist who smells a bit like mothballs and yeah. bullying, <laughs> trying to sell you a copy of Greenleaf Weekly, you know, wiping the froth from his beard as he reminisces fondly about private school. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, even language words, you know, has been sort of stolen from a, any kind of progressive consciousness where you have to almost kowtow to this blandification of, of discourse and not be political because it's uncool and um, go on with this third wayness and they're fucked but everybody else is fucked and I vote for the Greens but I don't consider myself left wing and I can't <laughs> use words, anything beyond progressive and an understanding of left and right boiling down to merely who is more nice to the gays. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, do More that, I, do, <laughs> I do find that problematic. Yeah. It's interesting. That there's a, one of my one of my um, very favourite plays by Michael Gurr um, called um, oh, I've got, I can't believe I'm going to forget Crazy Brave, um, which is strangely written a year before 9/11 and it is about a small terrorist cell in Melbourne. It's an incredible piece. And there's a wonderful line in that where the main character, who's a, who's a social activist, 
in the middle of this extraordinary speech about all that stuff, says actually says you can't even say the word socialism in this country anymore. Mm. For all of those reasons, you know, that, that, that everyone just sort of throws their hands up and goes, wasn't that last, you know, wasn't that 10 years ago? Um, and it's, and it, 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 it is an extraordinary phenomenon. What about you, Chris? Because you've had a lot to do with young writers in the last few years. Directly. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterise the younger generation as being noble or not politically engaged. And I think actually every generation has a segment that is the kind of need to, the kind of I want to express myself. It's just important to do that. I, I actually have great hope and great uh, faith, and have seen good evidence of uh, actually a new kind of a new thinking around political engagement. And for me, the the big shift has actually been uh, that. The, the, the document, the playtext itself, has been something that's been suspicious, and I've lived through the kind of generation that went well away from the idea of making a play. Sure, there are a couple of generations of the play running as a nationalist project and thinking about what that voice was. Um, and because we, Van and I, were just in Sweden and having to think on, you know, just to, to explain to people what an Earth Australian theatre is and just how amazing it is that we can talk to the people who kind of created the way in the industry that we understand now, that that's, you know, across the world quite unusual, although strangely enough the Scots seem to also have quite a shallow mm. history mm. when it comes to particularly around the idea of a voice mm. on stage because, you know, it wasn't, it was only 30, 40 years ago that the idea of putting on a play with an Australian accent was seen as kind of distasteful and kind of appalling or even outrageous mm. uh, that you could put an Australian accent speaking Shakespeare in outrage mm. and uh, you go to you know, somewhere like Oslo, where it's, it's tiny, but there are two giant statues out the front of their national theatre, one of Ibsen and one of Bjorn Bjornsson, that famous playwright that we all know here. <laughs> but there's an understanding and a kind of rich history of understanding around cultural expression that we find so problematic. But what's fantastic about the generation that's much younger than me is that, that there's a kind of reclamation going on around the idea of a play text, that it's not something kind of ugly or unpleasant or colonial or, or oppressive, I suppose, and that, that the making of theatre, they have kind of, they've garnered all the understanding of the, the kind of political engagement, the national engagement, but also the, the benefits of people who are making theatre in a different way that's non-text and non-narrative. And so there's a kind of openness and a willingness to, to absolutely engage in, in what's formally possible with theatre. I think that's actually really exciting. And so the best of the kind of playwrights who are coming up uh, is that there's a, there's a, you know, theatre is so cynical and trend-driven at its worst that people tend to imitate certain key texts and you kind of locate those key texts and see people who are imitating them. Um, it is actually, there's a, there's a fantastic joy around the idea of we'll just steal a bit from here and steal a bit from there and, and sometimes that bricolage is problematic but actually the most exciting theatre makers um, can kind of assimilate all that information and then generate work that is genuinely kind of game changing. And I think that's pretty exciting. What would you, could you give us an example of the game changing stuff? Uh, well, I, well uh, uh, one I worked on just before I went to Sweden actually, uh, and in, well, we, we've had a lovely suite of plays we've been working on the, so far this year at Playwright in Australia. Uh, one of them was Vans. And it kind of signals also, uh, I suppose, if, if you look at, the, say, the last 15 years around the way that people have tended to write plays and what the plays that have kind of been the beachheads, I suppose, for a long time people were very influenced by the kind of Mark Raven Hills and the Sarah Canes, that sort of in-your-face generation, quick, let's put some junkies, you know, shooting up in the eyeball, awesome, that's going to get on stage. And then things moved well away from that sort of blood and sperm generation to a very quiet, uh, very uh, ultra-naturalism. Uh, even in Australia, you can see that with Raimondo, the way Raimondo Cortez has changed. In, in you know, his early plays were kind of reveling in the extremes of language and of kind of human sexual possibility, I suppose. And then with with Rand, as they've gone for that, that kind of deep ultra-naturalism, where it's almost like, what is that drama? But of course, there is embedded within it a kind of richness of of, um, of dramatic possibility. And and uh, a play like you know the, the Irish Paris, that's only comic person. And then working on Van's play, and then Declan Green's play, and Jamal Gomery Griffith's play, and even Angus's play this year, it seems that people are finding a, a, a theatrical mode that makes the most of what actors can do, uh, but also doesn't require huge sets, or you can do that if you want, but also just goes back to the, the joy of having an actor talking. 
but you don't need that much actually to take people on a huge natural journey. And there's a play called Terminus, uh, which you, I think it's come down here. It is, it's yeah. about to be. Oh, it's on. Go and see it. Um, but it's, it's, it, it's one of those plays that uh, I suppose um, is, is gorgeous for what it allows an audience to do. Uh, and Van's um, play that's on at Griffin Theatre Company next year, um, The Bull, the Moon and the Crown of the Stars, um, has learned the great lesson of that, which is that two actors talking as well as they didn't know, but theatre companies love it when there's no set and you know, there's only two actors in it. Um, but, but you can take audiences anywhere. So there's a kind of, there's a, there's a thinking around that European inheritance, particularly around drama as well. And Van was really tough on herself because hers was also based on a Greek myth, uh, on the, the story of Ariadne. And it was, it was a lovely thing going through a script where she said, be tough on me, be tough on me. Make sure there are no metaphors or similes or even words that aren't classical. You know, and she wants all her, her, her um, similes and her metaphors to be really, uh, really concrete. And so there was one point she talked about Japanese kanji. Had to go. Had to be <laughs> anyway, um, and, and then on the other hand, so we're in, in one room we've got very, you know, educated, feeling very smart. And in the other room we've got Declan Green's play called uh, uh, eight gigabytes of hardcore pornography, where they're you know really looking at what the hell happens on those internet chat rooms, and, and you know it's disgusting. <laughs> but, but you know he's but what's brilliant about that play in particular is the fact that he's rethought very deeply um, about because it's about how people communicate. It's about uh, two forty year olds who start dating on the internet, and it's absolutely heartbreaking but painfully hilarious. But every scene he's rethought. The way that we communicate. So one scene's text messaging, one scene's, you know, every time it's a new filter between us and an audience. And it's lovely to see him embedding that in the play, but it's also not overly complicated, it's actually very, very simple. And uh, I just remember Simon Stevens, who's a terrific uh, UK playwright, said that, you know, he always encourages his students because he was a tutor at Royal Court for about six or seven years uh, for the Young Writing Program. He said, you know, playwrights have to be thieves. We have to steal because that's how you get better. And you know, steal from people who actually know what they're doing. And then you start to find out yourself. You know, I'll stop talking. <laughs> hey, you're working at the moment on a version of Medea, correct? For Belvoir Street. Yes. Which is just the boys, am I right? Just the kids. Uh, we're doing it from the kids' point of view. <laughs> <laughs> um, Medea does come in um, about four times during the play, but ultimately, I mean, we want to. Put or to um, kill them. Yeah, or to... The Are story... Sure <laughs> <laughs> no, we actually want to put on the poster, yes, it's the one where the kids die. <laughs> because we've been inundated. Because you put kids on a poster and publicise that there's kids in it, then people think it's a family show. Mm. And yeah. We've been inundated with bookings for <laughs> eight-year-olds and things. And, um, so we've, we've, we try and... Wel I welcome them in because they won't know. The, the thing that we're doing is... And this is something that I have a bit of a bee in my bonnet about. It's a new play. Mm. But unfortunately, more often than not, we're getting asked to, can you just name it this? Can you just name it this? So not that Belvoir did that, but I think it's, uh, it's happening a lot. So you did consider a different, different type? I wanted a different type. It's not that. It's not Medea. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, Medea's happening off stage. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, definitely, that's what I've got in my mind when I'm writing, that Jason's there and, you know, he's gone off to be with the princess and she's having a meltdown. And it's a domestic going on, but we are in the room with our two little boys who are about to die and they don't know that. And, um, and that, for me, the politics is off stage. And I think that's where I differ a little bit from Stephen and Van. I, I, am, I consider myself a political writer. Um, my, my most successful play was about... Agent Orange, IRA, and Vietnam. <laughs> um, uh, um, in, in set in the uh, in Sherwood Forest. <laughs> and um, my the greatest thing uh, that anyone ever said to me was, "Oh, but your plays aren't political." That wasn't a political play. And in fact, it couldn't be more political. That the things that I was talking about. I'm an Agent Orange survivor, so I was writing what I knew about, and I, I write a lot about that subject matter. But I like a good family drama. And I like a really, really um, good story, which these guys are also amazing at. Um, so I, uh, for me, politics comes second. For me, it's all about um, disguising the politics amongst a, um, amongst a, uh, something that 
we can all recognise. I don't ever want to wave my finger. I want, I want the audience to wave their fingers at themselves, and hopefully I want to be the one to turn the finger around, but I don't want to be the one to shake it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, um, yeah so, I, and I, I grew up on Stephen's work as well, which I just adored, and you encouraged, you encouraged me so much to, to be political and to, and to um, I didn't, and, and when I got to a stage uh, where I was asked to write my autobiographical piece, which is called The Seed, about the Agent Orange stuff, um, it came really easily because I, I had this amazing group of writers that I'd studied that allowed me to do that. I, I was allowed to do that. And I studied under Tony Nichols, who's here. Yeah. There. <laughs> Tony, um, you know, he also, he was very, very good at bringing politics into great storylines, and I, I took a lot from Tony on that level. Um, but yes, I'm doing the data. But it's not a political version, it's, a, it's hanging out with the kids. I suppose, I suppose what I was interested in is what it, you know, thematically, I'm so fascinated by this because I've seen quite a lot of the, the, these kind of so-called renovations of recent time and, you know, loved a yeah. lot of them and, uh, Me too. you know, but, the, yeah. the, the, the idea of, I don't know, somebody, it was Joseph Campbell, somebody said, you know, what are that, there's like the seven stories or whatever it is, I don't know, I don't actually never really held with that, but there certainly is something kind of very resonant about the, you know, those, the, the Greeks particularly and Shakespeare and whatever that, you know, that seem like... They're universal. I ended up drawing most of my research and dialogue, um, not from the actual Euripides version, but from articles that are happening every single day in our newspapers about parents throwing their kids off bridges, Sorry to make it dark for a moment, but that's what they're doing. The, you know, these parents that are having meltdowns, they're breaking up, they're running off with the kids, they're doing all sorts of terrible things. Every single day that's in the newspapers, that's my day. Mm. That's what we're dealing with. And I was getting, I, the thing that made me most cross was that when I asked anyone about this woman, they'd say, she's that horrible woman that killed her kids. And they forget about this, there's no excuse for that, of course, but they, they were forgetting about the backstory um, that was going on, they were forgetting about what an asshole Jason was. And, and they were forgetting about what, what she and him had been through and the love story that was there. And I was seeing that love story and I was seeing the Argonauts and I was seeing the myths in these newspaper articles every day. I still do. And so that, that for me is our story, not, um, not necessarily so much the Greek myth. Um, and, and luckily our two little boys who have never acted before they're 13 and 11 and have never been on stage. Get it. Mm. They just get it. There's no, they don't know the theatre, they, they don't understand theatre language. So we're not even trying to teach them that, we want to keep them away from that. And they are just, we don't ever say death or anything in front of them, but they... So they know. don't know what happens. They do, <laughs> they do. They just know, you know, and they... At the end of the show, when the door closes, they usually pop their heads around and go, "I'm dead." <laughs> <laughs> and we all go, "Oh!" And, uh, but they think it's hilarious, and that and there, there's the tragedy of it. There, there it is. So um, that that's where I get my politics from, I guess, family, and and um, and what feels icky in here is what I like to put on the stage. <laughs> Specialist in ink. Yeah. <laughs> ink is my favourite word. Um, I'm just curious about, you know, when you, when, as a performer, obviously, you know, you get very strong relationships, and, and this, is, uh, this would be a good question for you too, Kate, of course, but um, you get really kind of a good sense of an audience, you know, the pin drop idea or the, oh, I'm so sorry, the chocolates idea. What's, what do you think? What do you think is turning audiences on at the moment? What, as a performer, what when you step on stage, what, what are the kinds of shows that are really? Well, it's funny, I've only really talked about what I I know, what I've been doing. I guess um, shows that I've been in that have been, you know, incredibly contemporary works and quite challenging in that sense. Things uh, like Benedict Gander's first show in Melbourne at the Malt House, but on was a show called Eldorado, and it was. The, like, the third show that the new regime at the Malt House had done, which was kind of Michael Cantor and Stephen Armstrong taking over. Um, so they'd done a couple of shows in rep. They did The Ham Funeral and Tom Wright's Journal of the Plague Year, which they were trying to get on for years and years and years, and no one put it on. So of course, when Michael took over the company, that was the first thing he did. Um, but our show, 
no one knew Benedict in Melbourne. It was the middle of winter. The show was, I think, at nearly three hours without an interval. It was behind glass with radio mics. And, um, <laughs> and it was awesome, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, still think it's one of the best things I've ever done. We played to sometimes 18 people a night in the Melbourne <coughs> theatre, which is massive. And it was extraordinary, but I just don't know whether people were ready for that kind of thing. And I sometimes think if it went on now, it would be a much different story, you know, with the reputation that Benedict now has and has chipped away trying to destroy it sometimes. Um, but after that, we then did a, a, a really collaborative show that we created called Moving Target with some of the same people, the same writer, same director, same company, um, half of the same actors and a few more involved, but it came out of... Uh, Including Rita. It was Rita, yeah. yeah. So me, Matt Wood, Rita, Carlier, Rob Menzies, Julie Forsyth and Alison Bell. Uh, and that was, it just came out of like elements of just device and we play hide and seek for weeks on end. And, just kind of messed up this hall in Fitzroy and, and just kept doing that, kept doing that, and things kind of came out of that. And then Marius went to Germany and wrote a text as a response to that. And then we kind of met the next year and integrated the two. And it was kind of the opposite of what El Dorado was, but a very, it's, it was such an extraordinary energy in this production. And now I just did a show, uh, Death of a Salesman at Belvoir, which is kind of the inversion of that, where you take an extraordinary classic text which is incredibly tried and tested and you know, doesn't really put a foot wrong. It's quite amazing in that sense. But all we had on stage was a black space, a 1997 Ford Falcon, and actors with words. And that's kind of the opposite, I guess. It's, people just fell in love with it. It sold out and played for eight weeks and uh, to the point of you know, nearly destroying one of our actors from exhaustion. Um, but that's as simple as this. You, you put this amazing story on stage, which everybody wants to see, and you don't really need all of that extraordinary theatricality in some way. But I think that's the trend that's kind of happening as you, recently, and you know, especially in Simon Stone's productions, is just stripping back and stripping back and stripping back until basically all you have is just the text and some great people telling it to you. I kind of made the joke that soon you'll just have a glass box on stage with the script, you know, you won't even need that. <laughs> but, yeah. but it is actually, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I didn't see Salesman, I, I, I did try, but sadly you couldn't get a ticket. Yeah. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, it, that, it's, it's actually the opposite to that though, isn't it? It's, it's, it's actually about the intimacy an audience is experiencing with the flesh. Yeah. That's, that's what's so... Yeah. kind of successful in, 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 in that line. Like Thaestes, this is a... A uh, Hayloff show that Simon Stone directed uh, had a, had a um, similarly terrific season. Yeah, yeah. Um, filled with those moments on stage. And, and actors of people, I think sometimes, I don't think anyone here would think this, but I'm, I'm, it always surprises me that people think there's a wall here that we can't we can't hear and see everything. We know who's got a mobile phone, we know who's on racking a lolly, we know who's got a bit of a cough, we know who's who knows all the words to the Shakespeare. And so in those moments on stage, and Death of Salvin was filled with them. And the other one I saw, which was oh, just exhilarating, was The Dark Room by Angela Betson mm. at Downstairs Belvoir um, about a year ago now. Tiny space, but just pin drop, pin drop stuff, and everyone at once sitting forward like, as the actors leaned forward, the audience leaned forward, and it was just like this moving, breathing beast. And that's how I felt in Salesman as well. And that, that's good storytelling. And that's, for me, that's why I go to the theatre, no matter what the story is. That moment where we're all breathing and taking it all in and learning a lesson and getting educated and being political and up telling the story. Yeah, it's important to acknowledge though, and um, I have been making a name for myself on the panel circuit by slagging off Shakespeare recently. <laughs> um, because a conclusion that I came to, because I work as, my job at the Mort House is not as a writer, even though it is in writing now, and there is a dramaturg. You know, my job is to birth, um, is to birth text, work with living writers on making living text better, and work with living directors on making the text of dead authors better. That's what I do. And, um, and in my study of narratology and the way that we construct narrative, like Shakespeare becomes incredibly problematic because what we understand in his story, and this is always, 
you know, my the first point of engagement for me ideologically and dramatically when we're doing an adaptation, because in Malthouse we're famous for doing them, we take a text, we fuck it up, we change it. No, I'm working on an adaptation of a Basel opera at the moment my, myself. Um, I'm not the drum Turk on my own text. But a conclusion I came to is what we understand to be story is based on a series of cultural assumptions. And my issue with Shakespeare is that you're looking at a man who was writing in a period where black people were not considered to be individuals, they were considered to be property. You're looking at an era where women could be transacted in a marriage contract and not have any property rights. You're looking at an era where our, our understanding of what it is to be human is codified within a particular social experience of a privileged white man on a very small island in the North Atlantic, you know, that's based on um, property owning and inherited title and the notion of kinship. And um, if we just take, and you can say this about, you know, numerous playtexts and their point of origin, if we just take that story and those story elements and we don't critique the assumptions of power that inform you know, status within that story, we end up texts that replicate, and this was my issue, I will admit quite publicly, with The Wild Dark, yes. um, which was a play that I found, the original play by Ibsen I think is a wonderful revolutionary piece of drama, but taking it out of its historical context, which is what Simon Stone did, I, to me made it an incredibly misogynistic and intimidating piece of women are all castrating bitches propaganda. And this is the issue for me, is, is looking at, you know, what are the cultural messages that we broadcast through text and, you know, the great responsibility of theatre makers to culturally contribute to, you know, liberation and empowerment with society. And I, I mean, I write plays not about, I don't finger point in plays, I like to think I'm at a stage in my playwriting development where I use plays as a means of testing out the inconsistencies in my own opinions. Like, great belief that ideologically is a framework, not a straitjacket. Um, and certainly I write a lot about violence because as a feminist I loathe violence because if you legitimise violence all women are basically fucked. But as a revolutionary I have to support violence because otherwise how else do you smash the state? And of course these are theoretical positions but you know they contradict one another and that's what you investigate. That's what you know, makes drama interesting. You know, Ibsen checked his, himself, Chekhov checked himself. You know, the, these are the, what we find interesting. Brett, you know, constantly destabilising how to be good, you know, what, what does it mean to be good in a bad society? But I do, you know, whenever I hear the word storytelling, I do get alarmed about, you know, what are the assumptions there? Where are we taking the story from? Within adaptation, you know, are we actually critiquing, you know, what the impact of replicating a certain story in a different context will be? And I think that's that's a challenge for the adaptations that go on in particular. Yeah, so if I could, if I could just contextualise, I think, um, just briefly, just so that people kind of have the idea that Simon Stone's production of The Wild Duck, which was madly successful in both Sydney and Melbourne, although creating a, a huge block storm in Melbourne, was updated from the 1890s, I suppose, originally, yeah. to, to, uh, to a contemporary context, and its central character played in an astounding performance by Nita Hegg. Um, the, the plot turns on her being pregnant, really, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. and, um, and what she's forced to do as a result. So and, and I, I actually had quite a shock, because I, I loved that production, and, I, I, and I, I still say that I loved it, despite the fact that I was actually completely, personally, very embarrassed when I ran into Van in a foyer just after seeing it. And I was going, oh, you know that? And Van was furious and just mm -hmm. kind of went, this, 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 and this about un unpacking what those things were. And I realised that what I'd done is kind of floated between the two periods. I'd kind of gone, yeah, yeah, I mean, that belongs to the early 90s and, and this belongs to, I was going to say the 1980s. <laughs> that dates me. <laughs> <laughs> the Nordics, whatever. We were all there, uh, come on, we were all there. So I was kind of doing an automatic drift between the two and forgiving it in, in the slippage. But uh, then in speaking to someone who really had not had that experience in the theatre and band was not the only person I spoke to like that. It was, it was actually really interesting because it was so seductive and, and really very, very fine as a production. I mean, it really was wonderful. But, um, uh, but it, it, it did prove to me how dangerous, I suppose, a drug art in general but theatre can be mm -hmm. if it's very, very, very persuasive. There's a great story we had in Mary that the, uh, 
theatre conference in Sweden, which is why we were there. Um, uh, this woman from Palestine who makes theatre for young audiences were doing a show um, on the West Bank, and uh, it was for young audiences for kids. Um, although there were parents there, and a lot of the windows of the theatre had been smashed. Um, and they were, the guys who came to fix the windows turned up in the middle of the performance, mm -hmm. and they said, look, can you please not fix the windows now? And they're like, screw you, we're here to do a job, we've got 10 others today, I don't care, you've got some stupid theatre performance on, shut up, we're going to fix the windows. <laughs> and, uh, and they said, look, put, you know, you know, complex negotiations at the door, please, you know, we've got 150 kids in the room. And the guy, and they negotiated, okay, look, just let the performance finish, maybe you, might, you should watch some of it. So these guys are holding this huge sheet of glass to replace the window of this theatre, which is you know, smashed, and watching the play. And were completely beguiled by it and fell in love with it, and to the point where they forgot they were holding the sheet of glass. <laughs> 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 and so uh, it's, uh, I love that story, it's because you, you know, the, the, the great thing, great power, is that it does catch you in unexpected moments. And, uh, and uh, you know. Mm. I'm sure the kids weren't shouting glass. I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty of theatre. Just the other day, at Toby Schmitz's new play, I want to sleep with Tom Stoffard, just sat at a dinner table. A woman from the audience came and sat at the dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> Halfway through a scene. No. Yeah. Halfway through a scene and went, oh, it's just all so lovely. And <laughs> started eating the food and drinking. She was off her face, but she was, she was really, really into it. They had to stop the show and drag her out. She, was just, uh, just so, she walked from the back row. One of the, one of the great pleasures in Sweden was meeting, again, this woman who uh, I'd met when we brought her out to Australia, a fantastic director, her name's Suzanne Austin. And she kind of um, completely changed the way that people thought about the young audiences in particular. She was a very successful director. She had a career in main stage theatre, but she decided in the 80s to make, make theatre for young audiences and people were appalled and horrified and they thought she'd thrown her career away and of course she's a woman, well, she loves the children, why wouldn't she make, you know, but completely compartmentalising and, and condescending her. Um, but she actually started making, one of her first plays was um, about Medea actually and, uh, and, and, and she put this on stage and people were horrified that you could do this for children, how outrageous that you'd make a show about death, about a mother killing her children. Uh, for children, mm -hmm. uh, but that's the way that she thought. You know, these are important stories, kids can understand a lot more than we expect they can, um, and we don't need to patronise them. Um, and her most recent uh, series of shows, um, and I was telling Kate the other day, on, when we were at Toby Schmitz's play, in fact, um, was that she, you know, she's in Sweden, so of course she has her own company of actors and her own theatre. Um, <laughs> and she, she made a show with her partner, who's a psychoanalyst, and is um, Sweden's kind of leading uh, psychoanalyst for um, disturbed, um, abused children. Um, she's a very, very brilliant woman. But they made a, a show together for kids aged between six months and a year. Wow. Um, and her acting company all wanted to quit. They thought she was insane. <laughs> this would never work. That would be, you know, that'd be ridiculous doing theatre to screaming children as if that's ever going to work. And they spent, you know, Sweden, so it took a long time to, to make it over a series of workshops where they filmed the children watching as well as the performances themselves. Um, and what's extraordinary watching it is that these children are sitting in the laps of their dads, their mums, their grandparents, um, and they're. It was a play, by the way, that went for an hour twenty. Oh, just so you know. Um, that's and, like the, the, and, and sure, some of the kids did scream. Like a book, like for six. Some of the kids did scream, but it was no more than the people who were wrapping their lolly packets or people who walk out anyway. The proportion actually was almost exactly the same. Um, but the kids watched dialogue because you watch their little eyeballs, and they're, they're un unlike grown-ups, their mouths drop open. Mm -hmm. But they, they're watching dialogue. They're not following the kind of juggling or the. You know, look at me, kids. Um, and there was this great moment in one of the early workshops they'd done, um, where this little was a moment where um, the, the it was a story of a person from conception to being a year old. So, and the, the a, a fifty-year-old actress played that character, the baby, um, and the mother was played by a woman in her early twenties. So, for kids, they had to kind of invert immediately the way that you look at your parents. Anyway, but. There's this great moment where the little girl was having a tantrum, played by the old woman, 
uh, and then the mother was just oh, exhausted, the... oh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and kind of collapsed in, in exhaustion. And they don't want, they don't encourage kids to be part of the performance, but um, this little kid got up onto the stage and there were, there were six or seven actors watching the girl have a tantrum. And this little, this little girl went up and started pulling their trousers as if they should get, like, do something, stop that girl yeah. having a tantrum. And they're all a bit like, oh shit, there's somebody on stage. <laughs> um, and then she went over to the, to the mother character, played by the younger woman, um, and, and tried to stroke her oh. as if to comfort the mother when the kid's being naughty. But because their arms are so short, they're like, yeah. and they couldn't reach because their arms are too little. And so she plonked herself down on her ass and then got a foot up and started stroking her. And, and what's extraordinary, and, and, and talking to Anne Sophie, the psychoanalyst, is that we actually know very, very little about how kids' brains work and actually what they can receive and, and how they do process information. Probably because it's probably slightly unethical to experiment on children in the way that you might not know. Rat. Anyway. Depending on your ethical steps. Robots, who knows? Um, but it was extraordinary just to think that actually our understanding of, of empathy and compassion uh, goes obviously very deep, uh, and, but that they can follow story uh, fundamentally. And, and they're the theatre makers, they're the next generation. Coming yeah, well, and that's exciting. one of the questions actually to Suzanne was have that people tracked what's happened because it was six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. and, you know, are they better people? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know there's a measure for that, although in Bhutan, anyway. But, um, <laughs> But it's, it's, I suppose it, it opens possibilities for us about how we tell stories and, and who we can talk to and, and particularly for young audiences actually that we, you know, it doesn't need to be that sort of ridiculous trying too hard clown big feet nonsense. It can be, that's fine, but uh, that, that actually there's something very profound about that for us as makers. I'm wanting to just check in with you guys, see if anyone's got anything they'd like to ask anybody on the panel at this point. I, I'd like to follow up with a, a, a phrase Chris used a, a while ago. Chris, can you, you use the word reticence about something to do with perhaps Australian writing. Could you talk a little bit about what you meant by that? Reticence? Uh, there was a period in the 90s, I suppose, when theatre plays became really, really uncool in mm -hmm. Australia. And a lot of people wanted to go into film and into, you know, just to avoid telling stories in that particular way, we've been kind of bombarded by, you know, plays built in a certain way, and there were variations on that, and I think that certainly I was part of a generation who were, um, you know, just saw the play text as something restrictive, I suppose, uh, and it was such a tremendous relief when that period kind of ended, I suppose, and, and part of it was around nationalism, uh, and it was interesting to hear Stephen say that, you know, there was a very concrete um, you know, decisions certainly from, you know, people when you talk to, to Jack Hibbert or John Rommel about, you know, what their project was and which was quite different, of course, to the Women's Theatre Group at the time, which was much more internationalist and much more um, non-narrative in its end. But, but there was a certain uh, bombast around the idea of what a play text should be, particularly in an Australian context. And, and I was part of a generation that wanted to evade that responsibility in a way, or that kind of, um, the repercussions around what that might actually do as a, as a document. And it was so curious when, in the last couple of years, that that there's been such fury around uh, the way people have constructed their seasons um, with theatre companies, and, and such a kind of blindness and stupidity, really, from people who should know better. You know, when I, when I studied and went to university, it was absolutely, you know, key to the way that we thought about everything was that you think about, about class and race and gender as, as analytical tools and uh, things that you applied to everything that you did. And it was just bizarre to me that, that somehow people who, who are in charge have kind of given up the ghost or kind of didn't matter anymore and that art was a higher calling, that, 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 that something around taste or something around, you know, what's good enough is actually, you know, merit, I suppose, is, is our ultimate guide. Um, and it seemed to be such a, a foolish way of thinking about what our job was, I suppose. And, and certainly when you go down the kind of arty, you know, the... Sometimes Stylistics like, of vacuousness. Yeah, but when you, yeah. Go, when you evade 
text, actually that can be the worst um, in terms of apoliticism, I suppose. And that, that these two things combined made for a very dangerous period, I suppose. That art was a kind of higher thing. But they meant that we'd kind of forgotten actually what theatre can be and what should it be doing. Anyway, I'm not sure that answers your question, but certainly there was a period when, when the idea of a play text was pretty damn. Uh, and that, that um, but the, the next generation kind of absorbed that and, and hope. Uh, actually, there's a great uh, thrill around what you can do. With, with text, and that there's no fear of it actually, that there's that it's actually kind of incitement to discourse or more discourse, and there's actually a really exciting virtuous circle around, well, if they can do that, well, fuck, I'm going to do this. And if they can do that with a play, well, I'm going to make this. And so it's kind of funny that we're talking about Simon Stone all the time, even though um, I think, I don't know, I think I feel a pretty tired of talking to Simon, <laughs> but actually that he's, he's generating such fury. Uh, that actually I'm going to make theatre that's against that or that's different to that, and, and that's probably not such a bad thing. I think the key word is incitement. I mean, if a text is not an act of incitement, um, I find it problematic. And I, certainly at Malthouse, where I mean, we used to like Malthouse is the building that used to house Playbox, which Tom worked for, which was a very different company, mm -hmm. and Playbox did. Um, did text like narrative text-based drama, and that's fine and that's great. But Michael Cantor, um, when he took over Moore House, went, no, we're going to be a house of hybrid performativity. There's already a playhouse in Melbourne, that's the MTC. We don't need to double up, and I'm interested in the spectacle project. And certainly Marion Potts, who's the new artistic director, um, has embraced you know, the notion of a, of a house of hybrid performativity, that we mix it up, you know, it's opera, it's dance, it's mine, we're doing a puppet show next year, so excited. Mm -hmm. um, and combinations and permutations of all of that. And when, and, you know, with our product and what we make, for us it's about performativity and it's about the full range of, of different skill and theatrical craft and different experiences <coughs> of performance that you can bring to an audience. And this is very difficult to communicate to, to playwrights who are still in the old play box mode where you wrote your play, you gave it to it, you put it on. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not how we work. And certainly, like, I'm excited by a text that incites. And one of the reasons I love hate and campaigned so passionately in my theatre for us to put it on this year is because it's an act of incitement. What can you do to me? What can you do to me, director? What can you do to me, actors? How can you make me live and breathe? And the interesting thing is that you will have two completely different experiences reading, as a script, reading it as a script and seeing it as a show. But just to, to go to your point of reticence, uh, Clarion Australia is we, we live in carriage works, which is a, all our neighbours are funky, cool, theatre making companies. And everyone, when we moved in there, said, Oh, you're with your old phonies in there with your boring plays <laughs> uh, and your old fashioned kind of theatre. And not a week goes by when one of my neighbours doesn't pop out and say, I need a writer for this thing. You know, and they're actually actively searching for, for people who understand this thing that goes on between performers and an audience. And, you know, not everybody can do it. And I think that, you know, even in the cinema where we've lived in Australia with the kind of era of the writer director, where it's mostly directors who can have a crack at writing, but I think we know when the real writers are there that actually there's a fantastic story and, and writers are crucial. And there's a kind of evasion of that fact for a while. Right. Sure. 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 Follow up on the text as an incitement because I think um, certainly there's a, lot of, there's a lot of talk at the moment about uh, hybrid and theatre and you know what that means um, and uh, someone said to me the other day, oh, well if you want the theatre world to show how much fun a piece of theatre now it has to have 47 screens on stage and someone has to hang off a trapeze and pull ch chooks out of us. You know, if it's just a well, <laughs> you would. If it's, if it's just a well written play, you've got no hope in the world of being funded. And that there's a there seems to be from what I hear, it's just kind of a groundswell of feeling of despair about about government supporting, you know, the well written text. Um, and the other thing that uh Elaine Valentine said to me just the other day, she said people are making hybrid work which has writing in it that no one would get away with if it was just a text. That, that, that somehow hybrid work is excusing poor quality writing. I'd like you to respond. Well, I think 
I, I, would, I wouldn't mind having a quick response to that, Charlie. I think two things. Um, for a, a friend of mine uh, who's a very, very fine dramaturg and director, Francesca Smith, has recently received close to $50,000 for a production of uh, Vivian Walsh's play, This Is Where We Live, which they've been working on for five years. It's an astounding text. With a great team, I think it got funded not just because of the text, but also because it has Alison Bell and Fiona Crombie designing and Francesca directing. It. So the team is funded, you know, um, but but it, but it, it's it's a no bells no whistles. It's two actors, very simple at Griffin. You know, I mean, it, I think that, I think the interest is still there. Um, but you know, it, it certainly I think the days of going oh we'll just, we'll just read the play, we'll fund the play, which I sort of remember more, I suppose, from the playbox end of things, which is a slightly different model. But I mean, I think perhaps those days are gone. The team is, is, is important now, but I think that's right and proper. It might be. Um, and the other thing is that I think in hybrid writing, one of the things that, that we all need to remember, and you know, I just throw this, we've got a few minutes, so I'll just throw it around just very quickly. But the thing is about the idea of a hybrid text is that it isn't just the words. A hybrid text is a visual narrative, a physical narrative, uh, literary narrative, it, it actually is a, a, a kind of a layer of sequencing things. So yes, it's not kind of like your, like, like Kate's writing or like Vince's writing or, or, or whatever, it's not that finely often, not that sometimes it is, but it's not often that finely brought, but it, it also needs to be read in a completely different way to the way in, one, in which one might read a text text. That was my quick response, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I argue with the notion of the finely written text. I mean, the finely written text is the hard craft that leads to, for me, what makes good writing is a, a text which, uh, in, like, enfranchises the creativity of every other person who works on that show. That, to me, is good writing. Because if you are engaging the creative process of a performer, as well as the creative process of a director, and, and designers in whatever combination they come to your text, then you're making something that is entertainment. Because yes. if the actors are bored, everybody else is going to be bored too. And, you know, highfalutin poetic expressions of, of conversation, that's, that's not good writing. You know, beautiful expression does not equal, you know, great dramatic writing. It just doesn't. And the other thing too is, you know, I mean, I've, I haven't had grants from the Australian Council to produce work. Um, I've had grants to go on little trips. Thanks. But I mean for me the, the issue is that you know well, people have to understand that the Australian Council is there, not people have to understand, I have to understand this too, to like to enfranchise artists. And art is the importation of new signs. Art is the project of something unique occurring in a unique historical moment. And writing a play of a form that was popular 10, 20, 30 years ago, where you read your Martin Crimp or your Mark Ravenhill or your Sarah Kane, and you replicate in the artistry and uniqueness of other people, that's not art, that's mimicry. You know, and writing that beautifully and writing that well and doing a very good facsimile or copy, that's not an artistic project either. And like, it's hard. You can't just, you know, put up your hand to participate. You know, you have to bleed and suffer and, and force yourself into those, you know, unique moments of, of creativity and those unique moments of expression. And realistically, I don't know of any theatre artist ever in the history of, world, of the world who's ever approached even striking distance of greatness without being surrounded by great collaborators and great actors and great directors. And realistically, that's the journey that you're on as a playwright and that's what you have to be engaged by. That's my favourite thing about being a playwright. Is being a, is knowing the team that's going to be around me, and suggesting something in my text that may it. I guess that's the point. It may look really banal on the page, but I know that that um, Paul Charlie or Steve Toolman or Hamish Michael will take the sound of it and just blow it out of the water. And you know, that, I can't do that. I can't even. I don't even have the words to make that happen, but they do. Like Kate Mulvaney in Buried Child at Belvoir, which was one of the most extraordinary pieces of acting I've ever seen. It's a love fest. It was my special G string. It was the ponytail. I made a point of uh, the five or so. Kate and I last week saw a show at Belvoir called The Conversation Piece, which was uh, uh, an extraordinary show. But the text in that. Uh, 
comes from an improvisation on a theme by the dancers. And the text by itself, you, you wouldn't pay money to read it. I was cringing. It's, 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 it's just like a, a Gen Y conversation between three people about, oh, you know, did you see this film or uh, Team America, Matt Damon, all this kind of stuff. And, and it's, that's not the interesting part of the play. It's three actors and three dancers, and they kind of, you know, uh, interweaving throughout the entire show. But that text is then recorded and repeated, and it's the form that explodes that into all these other interesting ways, and that's, that is the most extraordinary thing to watch how you can deal with this one thing that repeats on itself and gets kind of turning all these other amazing things. I went from wanting to walk out in the first 10 minutes because the, I was going, because I was going, this dialogue, I could write, I could write this one. I'm doing all that. <laughs> to, you know, it's improvised, but even that I was going, terrible improvisation. And then did not want to leave the theatre. At the end of the piece, just wanted it to keep going and going and going and going. And I was crying. I was... My heart was raised. It was just it was such an emotional, physical, political response as well. There was stuff in there. The way that, the way that um, it, who was the, who was the choreographer? Lucy. Lucy yeah. had had made had made it actually this piece of being human. And it was it was new. Like it was I've never seen anything like it really. And I, if that's an excuse for bad writing to create new forms and to see new results, then I wouldn't support it. It's just about, just reminded me of the, the seagull. Just <laughs> 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 as I said at the beginning. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for being here today. We'll wrap it up here. Thank you.